I make electrical recordings from living neurons. And so when, I, when a neuron talks back to me in real time, it's one of the most exciting things you can observe in science. Ever since I was a kid, uh, I wanted uh, to be a marine biologist. So that meant that everything I did in my academic life was geared toward my end goal. But you end up doing what you set out to do. There isn't anything better. I'm an associate professor of marine biology and ecology here at Rasmus. I wanted to do high-tech neuroscience and medical school is a great place to find all the goodies, all the toys to make um, uh, the best use of the, the state of the art. My intention was always to come back to marine science with those technologies and use them in my marine science research. We work on the California sea hare that you see around us. Its scientific name is called Aplesia californica. We study aspects of its lifespan and ask questions about how its physiology changes with different times of its life. It only lives one year. So that relatively short lifespan is a good way to study the whole life cycle of the animal in a relatively short period of time. Right this minute, what we're working on, uh, the animal's resistance to hypoxia. So it is native to the California Rocky Intertidal, so the Pacific Intertidal, and it is frequently exposed to air for long periods. This animal has a gill, it breathes uh, oxygen through the water. And so if it, an animal has a natural resistance to hypoxia, essentially it holds its breath when it's in air, we're wondering how the nervous system resists the insults that are or ordinarily conveyed by hypoxia. A reflex behavior that is very routinely examined in the lab and is very sensitive to things like the animal having seen a hypoxic insult is something called the uh, time to write. So you pick up the animal, you bring it to the top of its cage, and you let it go at the top of the water column. It drifts down to the bottom, and then it rights itself and sticks down by its foot and begins to take its first crawling step. Essentially, it wants to escape from you in a very slow manner. That reflex involves a tremendous amount of the nervous system in coordination, and an animal that is poorly coordinated because of disease, age, or uh, physiological insult will have an abnormal time to actually complete the writing reflex. Another reflex we use a lot is called tail withdrawal, and this is how the animal responds to a pinch at the tip of its tail. It's a startle response. It will withdraw the tail, ball up, and relax. So this animal is an invertebrate. It is a mollusk. It is uh, uh, related to things like octopus and squid and snails. It's actually a snail. Uh, that makes it a so-called lophotrochozoan. That's a, a, a small subset of the invertebrate uh, kingdom that has quite a few similarities to uh, human models. Um, or primate models. Then there's the nervous system aspect. The nervous system of all uh, eukaryotes on a very elemental level works exactly the same. And so when you are working at a very basic level of nervous system physiology, you can very readily apply what you learn in a simple animal like aplesia to more advanced species like humans. And in fact, when we study the aging process, uh, at, when the animals are about 10 months old in a 12-month lifespan, uh, we are effectively looking at 70 and 80-year-old uh, uh, physiology. These animals um, are very slimy. They don't have scales or anything like that. They produce a slime on their skin, which is protective. It's part of their immune system. So our strategy for keeping them clean and healthy is uh, to use what's so-called single-pass seawater, where the seawater flows into the cage and then flows back out again. The waters around Miami are so-called oligotrophic. They are very nutrient poor. This is a huge advantage to us. When you take oligotrophic nutrient poor waters and you chill those waters down before introducing the water into these cages, you almost eliminate any kind of uh, pathogen that would be able to live in the cooler water. So the, the threat to the animal's health is much less 
when you take warm oligotrophic water and cool it down than if you moved our entire operation to a cooler climate. For example, Massachusetts. That's a lot closer to the temperature that the animals like, but that water is full of nutrients and microorganisms. And without the benefit of changing the temperature, those bugs would come into the water supply perfectly intact and potentially threaten our animals.